All right, it's nine o'clock. I know we're live and recording and I see the attendee numbers keep rising. So I love that. I'm um, seeing that number going up. I'm going to just start us by welcoming, welcoming everybody. We're going to do our diversity and inclusivity webinar today with Dr. Tyrone Bledsoe. We're very happy to have him. He's going to talk to us about bridging the academic achievement gap. Our agenda for today is going to be a welcome by our, um, by our own vice president of student affairs, Dr. Vasilou. Then we'll have our um, guest speaker talk. We'll do a little Q and A. So please feel free as you're like listening to anything or anything that comes up and you have questions, please make sure you put them in the Q and A so that we can have that um, question and answer um, after um, the presentation. And there'll be a little conclusion wrapping things up for you just to make sure um, we have your feedback so we can provide some more of these wonderful webinars for you all. Um, if you're new to WebEx, which I think most of you might not be, but this is an event, so you're all muted. Um, again, you'll have the Q&A and the chat window available to you. So in the chat, you can put any technical issues you're having and in the Q&A, please put all your questions and answers in there. And that's what we're gonna be monitoring. For your best experience, we recommend the grid view, um, which you'll find on the top right, um, that you can go there and see the speaker and everybody else. Um, in a better way. Again, Q and A. You'll find that with the new um, WebEx update on the bottom right, next to the chat. There are three dots. Click on these three dots. You'll see the Q A. You can open it up and start typing your question. Make sure you're putting your questions in and making sure you're um, it's um, to all um, to everyone in the chat, so we can all make sure we're monitoring that for you. And then, if you have any technical issues, that goes into the chat. The chat is right there. You can click on that. Again, make sure it's to everyone. If you are having any technical issues during and nobody's responding to the chat, please make sure to um, call this. Uh, if, you're, if you're a student, the student help desk at 602-286-841, extension 2. And for employees, it's extension 1. We'll have people ready to help you out with that. And we would really, really love for you to give us feedback at the end of the webinar. Um, I will put that up again after we're done with the Q&A. Um, you can either go to that website or if you have a QR code or a camera with your iPhone, you can just take a picture. It will take you straight to the survey, but we would really appreciate all your feedback. With all of that said, I am going to hand this over to Dr. Vasilou, who is going to start us all off. Good morning. Student affairs staff, students, faculty, friends, attendees, would like to welcome you to our Student Affairs Day at Gateway Community College. This is a day to celebrate with our Student Affairs Division, which all of them are attending this uh, morning's event, and also to extend my gratitude and thanks to them all for the great work they have done uh, in preparing for the fall semester, which is underway, in supporting our students and ensuring that they have the services available to them to be successful. I would like also to thank some individuals that they were very engaged uh, in this event, uh, starting with uh, uh, Student Life and uh, our director, Jesse Palacios. Student Life is sponsoring this event today. So, Jesse, thank you for all your hard work in putting this together. I uh, would also like to thank Ms. Maribel Zuniga, my administrative assistant, who has coordinated this event along with uh, Ms. Carla Ganem, our MC and moderator of this morning's event. Our students for attending, our faculty for allowing our students to attend, uh, our executive team uh, and leadership of the college uh, that has allowed for this event to take place, our student uh, government association, our student clubs and student leadership that they promoted this event amongst the students. Um, so we're grateful to them all, and I would like to ex extend the personal thank you and gratitude to you all, particularly to my student affairs division staff. Thank you for all you do. Continue doing what you've been doing. Our students need that. It's also a distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Tyron Bledsoe, whom I had the opportunity and the pleasure to meet him in person uh, right before I left Miami to come over to Arizona and uh, join Gateway Community College. Dr. Tyrone Bledsoe is an educator with more than 34 years of high quality post-secondary education experience. 
She is the founder and the current CEO president of the Student African American Brotherhood Organization, SAB, a national organization with over 355 chapters in 41 states that endeavors to instill a spirit of care and enhance the experiences of young males of color in our country. Before transitioning to his role with SAB, Dr. Bledsoe served as Vice President for Student Life and Special Assistant to the President of the University of Toledo. He received his Bachelor's of Arts and Master's of Education degrees from Mississippi State University. In Counseling and Student Affairs Administration 27 years ago, with an emphasis in counseling psychology at the University of Georgia. Of the many articles and book publications, his most proud of contributions as an author and co-inspiring the book, African-American Men in College, and his scholarly publications and contributions were further solidified through his appearances on several talk shows where he has discussed issues pertaining to African-American and Latino males. Former President Clinton invited him to participate in the Clinton Global Initiative in Chicago June of 2011 to help save discussions on how the U.S. could strengthen its workforce. He was invited by the White House to attend a national summit on the success of black males hosted by Secretary of Education Arne Duncan as a direct response to President Obama's executive order for an initiative to address the success of African-American students. In 2015, he was nominated to the CNN Heroes Class of 2015 for his contributions to humankind and his impact as a world innovator, followed by an invitation to the White House in May of 2016 to receive the Presidential Service Volunteer Award for his innovation with Saab as best practice in the country, coupled with Saab's impact to communities across the nation. Without further ado, Dr. Bledsoe, welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Good morning. Thank you so much and a pleasure to have everyone on the platform. I want to start out by thanking Dr. Abbasolo uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, we met briefly in Miami, as you mentioned, and it's such a pleasure to uh, be with the uh, Gateway Community College uh, family and the Maricopa Community College District uh, wide. Uh, I've been a speaker in your district before some years ago and certainly agree, uh, enjoyed my time meet uh, with everyone in person and I wish I could be in person now. I, I shared that with the uh, student life staff and let me also pause and thank them, Jesse and Maribel and uh, Carla and others who have been a part of this planning team, uh, done an incredible job coordinating with me to make sure that this event happened today. I pray that we don't have many technical or any technical issues where I can get this uh, message across. I prepare some incredible things I think you'll enjoy, uh, and certainly uh, we hope you do that. We were just talking offline a few minutes ago, and Dr. Vassalou mentioned that one thing he appreciated, and I certainly appreciated him saying, is that I'm a pretty uh, straightforward, uh, to the point speaker, person, very passionate, and I certainly do not speak to impress, I speak to bless people. I'm not a preacher, I'm not a bishop. Uh, people think that sometimes. I tell people I'm not a preacher, I'm just a reacher. <laughs> so, uh, we certainly appreciate this opportunity uh, to have you on board today to discuss and embrace this theme, um, bridging the academic achievement gap. And I'll start my presentation at this point, and I thank Carla so much for sharing the screen. So, we hope you enjoy this, and I'll govern accordingly with our presentation. So, as we think about this, this theme, bridging the academic achievement gap to have something you have to bridge that, that suggests there's a disconnect um, to bridge something there's a disconnect and oftentimes uh, we in these institutions colleges universities and even school districts that i work with and i also want to mention that my program we work with young men from all backgrounds uh, latino hispanic alaskan native uh, asian pacific islanders we're very diverse and right now we're going through a brand refresh to change our logo and look at our messaging. So everyone that's a part of our program feels connected. That's a key word that you'll hear me talk about throughout this presentation is connected. I do wanna uh, invite that I will challenge you individually to think about 
uh, your why. Uh, why are you here today? Why are you in this platform today? Uh, if you're a faculty, student, administrator, whomever you represent as a constituent supporting the cause of higher education, if you will, why? What's your why today? Why are you here individually? Why are you here collectively? So as I go throughout my presentation, I certainly want to invite you to think about that, to embrace that, and certainly reflect as I go throughout and certainly share questions during the Q&A time. Let me move forward for the sake of time. I want to invite this book for your consideration, uh, a book that was recommended to me over 20 years ago. I was speaking at Texas A&M University, and a student came up to me after my talk, and she said, Dr. Bletto, and I'll give you perspective. I'm very specific, a white student, female, walked up to me and said, Dr. Bletso, giving your spirit, I think there's a book that you might enjoy. And, and, and I said, what's the name of the book? She said, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And I said, really? She said, I think it'll change your life. And I read this book and I've been referring to this book over 20 years. So if you haven't read this book, and as we talk about bridging the gaps, this is a good book for you to personally have on your shelf and certainly read and also operationalize. I always talk about context. So when we talk about context, uh, it always informs content. So you might say that to yourself, context always informs content. So I'm gonna give you a little of my context so you understand why I am who I am and why I care so much and why I chose to uh, dedicate 34 years, almost 35 years to higher education, to making a difference in students' lives and people's lives. And all of the awards and places that I've spoke around the world, uh, I, I've always remembered my context. So let me share some of my context with you as we go forward. This is a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. He says, oh God, make us willing to do your will, come what may. Increase the number of persons of goodwill and moral sensitivity. Give us renewed confidence in nonviolence and the way of love as taught by Christ. Dr. King, many know he was a pastor. He was a preacher and certainly pastor the church. And he was a third generation pastor uh, as his father uh, was a pastor and his grandfather. Here's a quote I love as well. And you, you're seeing the order that these individuals were taken away from us. Dr. King. Uh, assassinated in April of 1968. Robert Kennedy assassinated a few months later. Progress is a nice word, but change is its motivator and change has its enemies. And that's a quote I always embrace as I go forward. And one more for you. And we just lost this great pioneer, uh, John Lewis. If you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. And that's what I've done in the work that I do with my young men in our program. I decided to do something about the gaps, uh, the lack thereof, why people aren't complete. And I decided to personally do something about that. This picture here is three generations of kings, Dr. King, uh, his son, and his dad, three generations. I was inspired. Uh, I worked at Dr. King's alma mater, Morehouse, back in the 80s. So I learned a lot about Dr. King. I grew up, and you'll see why in a minute, why this person is so important to me. He, Dr. King, is so important to me. But three generations of men. And it inspired me to think about my own family. This is my family at my dad's funeral last year. And these are my brothers and our sons and our son's son. And we have five grandsons and great-grandsons not on the picture. When my dad was living, we represented five generations of men, Bledsoe men, five generation. And I go back to three generations of kings, inspired me to think about five generations in my family. What will we do? What legacy will we leave as we think about bridging the gap, the disconnects, right? Here's my home church, Bellflower Missionary Baptist Church in Mississippi. My town is very well noted as a part of the civil rights movement. I come out of Mississippi. My church I grew up in uh, was uh, 400 yards down the street from my home, our apartment. Uh, we lived in a three bedroom apartment, my parents and my four brothers and I. I have a twin brother, identical twin. 
Uh, some of you all have met my twin virtually and some in person on this platform today. And this is our church. And this church is significant because it was Dr. King's headquarters back in the 60s when he would be in our state of Mississippi. And so my brothers and I and others of my classmates, we experienced Dr. King and the civil rights leaders in our town. This is a picture of Dr. King taking us to school. And the context, once again, context will always inform content. The context of this picture is Dr. King taking me and my classmates to school to protect us from the KKK because we had just integrated the schools, the buses where whites and blacks would sit together for the first time uh, in these classrooms. And there was a threat levied uh, on black kids that if we show up at the schools, they were gonna kill us. So you see Dr. King and others of civil rights leaders holding us in their arms and putting their arms around us to take us to school. So imagine that context growing up where you had to be protected just to go to school. So I grew up really appreciating education. Really, no one had to ever tell me to go to school because when you're told you can't do something, it makes you want to do it even more. And so that's my context as I think about Dr. King in my hometown. And these are just pictures of us, what we witnessed as kids, marches and demonstrations. I tell students today, our George Floyd was Emmett Till. My mother was born where Emmett Till was killed. And so we grew up just a short ways away from where Emmett Till was killed. And we could have easily been in Emmett Till ourselves, my brothers and I. And these are just pictures of Dr. King and others. Uh, Jose William on this picture, walking kids, you know, to school. And uh, pictures of my hometown again, Dr. King and others. And as we go further, this is the downtown square of my hometown. You see Dr. King, Andrew Young and others uh, uh, protesting and uh, trying to help people get the right to vote in my hometown. This particular picture I'm very, very fond of because it's on the street where my grandmother and my great aunt live, Poplar Street. And it gives me an opportunity to really pose one of Dr. King's uh, popular quotes where he talks about vanity. And it goes as follows. Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular. But one must take it because it is right. I love that quote. And you see the boys walking along the streets. I can tell you about that story another time. But this is on the street that I grew up on with my grandparents and my great aunts and others of relatives who lived on this street in my hometown. Part of my context is I look at this picture and I see the pictures on the, the picture on the left of twins, and I am a twin. And I look at these young men who oftentimes when they start out in school, they're vibrant, they're excited to be in school. And we see the picture on the right. Where was it? What happened? Where was the disconnect? What happened with this bridge? Why wasn't there a bridge to connect these young men on the left so that the right picture wouldn't happen? Just giving you something to think about, a perspective. Here's one quote actually written by a young man from Baltimore. I use this when I do trainings in high schools and middle schools with staff. I just read this for you and I'm, it'll speak for itself. The title, cause I ain't got a pencil. I woke myself up because we ain't got an alarm clock, dug in the dirty clothes basket because ain't nobody washed my uniform, brushed my hair and teeth in the dark because the lights ain't on, even got my baby sister ready because my mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then when I got to the class, the teacher fussed because I ain't got a pencil. Talk about disconnect. Talk about perspective. I'll just leave that with you to think about because I ain't got a picture. Dr. King said our time, scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have misguided missiles. We have guided missiles and misguided men. Think about that. We have guided missiles and misguided men. This is a quote from the 50s. And we go further to say, rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There's an almost universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think, simply having to think. I challenge my young men every day around that. And then my last one here, 
a nation or civilization that continues to produce soft-minded men purchases its own spiritual death on an installment plan. Amazing, absolutely amazing when you think about the relevance of this quote even today. And this was the 50s. And this is a picture I just thought would be a bonus picture of Dr. King finishing at Morehouse College at age 19 when he had finished high school at 15. This is his picture when he graduated from Morehouse. Bachelor's, in, bachelor's degree in sociology was his background. So we come to this question as we think about our theme today, bridging the academic achievement gaps. Has America lost a generation of African-American male, males, Latino males, of young men in general? And this quote here actually could apply to a lot of different populations that we work with every day. But let's talk about our men. Is this the first time in American history that a generation would not exceed their parents educationally or economically? Is this the first time I've exceeded my parents educationally and economically? They're both gone now. I buried my dad last year, I buried mom when I was 23 in 1984. But they're both gone now. And I exceeded them educationally and economically. And I remind our students every day, why are you here? Somebody's counting on you to be here. Let's connect the dots. When we talk about academic achievement, let's give them a reason. Why are you here? Why are you at Gateway? Why are you at any of the college in the Maricopa system? Why? Education and economically, what do you want to achieve? And why? This is a picture that one of my young men actually drew for me. He crafted this picture some years ago when I talked about my mother. She worked at a plant, and oftentimes my mother complained about her feet hurt. She'd get off work, and we'd rub her feet because her feet would be sore because she stood at this plant making wheels for cars back in the day. And this picture really blesses my heart. My mother, who's exhausted and her feet sore, and she's, she's, she's putting her feet in the water to soothe them. The greater in me gives me strength. And it got me through school, got me through undergraduate, got me through my master's. When I think about my mom's feet and all of the shoulders I'm standing on and stood on to be where I am today. So I challenge our students every day. We help them frame, perspective. Why are you here? My mother said, get your stuff, boy. No excuses. Get your stuff. You go up there to Mississippi State and you get your stuff. You can have fun, but you better come back here with some stuff. My mother said, no excuses. So I remember in all the fun I had, undergraduate experience, my undergraduate experience, my best experience, one of my best experiences in life. But I remember what my mother said, go get your stuff and don't come back here without it. No excuses. We have too many students who get so close to the goal and they turn around, they give up. So Maricopa system, gateway today, faculty, staff, students, and others today, Let's not have our students get this far. Let's really dig into the data and see how many students are so close that they only need a class or two or so to finish, or they just need a little money to finish. And let's find those students and help them finish, because it's a sad commentary when they get this close and not finish. Only 41% of US citizens possess a bachelor's, uh, bachelor's college degree uh, or, or greater. 41%, this was data shared by Lumina Foundation, one of my big supporters of my organization. Only 17% of males of color over the age of 24 in the US possess a college bachelor's degree or greater. And that was shared by my good friend, Dr. Tosin, who was then at that time, the White House Deputy Director. This data may have shifted just a little, but not much more. And now we're dealing with the convergent winds of COVID-19 and also social injustice. So I wonder how that will impact the data now and those who will complete. We have to keep our eyes on this. I shared this data back in Miami, and Dr. Bachelou might remember I shared this. 40% of institutions were destined to struggle. This is before COVID. This is before COVID. And then COVID hit maybe a month after I shared this slide. And I wonder what that number is now. 40% of institutions destined to struggle. Many institutions have already closed, exhausted their reserves because of COVID. And I can only imagine what that reflection looks like now.
I challenge institutions, Gateway and others in the Maricopa system to look at yourselves. You may see yourself one way, but how do others see you when you reflect on your real, real reflection and perspective as an institution? Always look at, look at yourself, evaluate yourself to see how you're making a difference. Here's a perspective for you. One, psychology, anthropology, sociology, theology, not to mention geology, coupled with your data and theories are fine, but it means very little if one is not practical. I'm a practical leader. I'm a practical scholar. Some institutions are not practical in their approach, hence the disconnects, the gaps, because being practical for some people means revealing our humanity. It means revealing that we really do care. What makes my organization so special and what makes it so effective is that we have a spirit of caring about young men. We ensure that our young men, our students know their value and that they do belong. And they have a, the capacity to achieve just like others if simply given an opportunity. Some years ago, many of y'all may have heard of a high school, urban prep in Chicago, that were placing 100% of their seniors in colleges and they were graduating from high school and they had 100% graduation rate and 100% of these students going to college. So everybody in the country got excited about urban prep. They wanted to fly to Chicago to figure out what is urban prep doing to have 100% students graduate and 100% go on to college. What are they doing? And I would tell people, I, I can save your airline ticket. I can tell you what they're doing. They're caring. We invest in those things we care about. I'll say that again. You may want to write it down. We invest in those things we care about. I can tell what you care about in two ways where you spend your time and how you spend your money. As a vice president, three different times at different institutions, I've always told students in particular, you can tell what I care about. Watch how I spend my time. You can tell what this institution cares about. Watch how we spend our money. Follow the budget. You'll see what we care about. And we hopefully care about you. That's what I want this institution to care about. That's what I told my students. Watch my feet and I will be consistent. Whatever I say, that's what I'm going to walk. Dr. Vassilou said that earlier, whatever I say, I'm walking that. And we need to be uh, 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 walkers of the talk that we give our students. A college that only desires to make money and celebrate data has failed its main constituency, the students. A college that only desires to make money and celebrate data has failed its main constituency, the students. Stand for your mission is what I often challenge people to do and administrators around this country. Main reason students leave without a degree, based on my research, lack of engagement and interaction. Generation Z arrives on campus to engage differently. They engage and expect something from us differently. They're not going to ask for help and tell you they're struggling. Many of them, particularly males, will not tell you that. They'll give you the impression everything is good. I had one university uh, in the state of Minnesota, I won't call the institution. They called me in and said, we'd like your program and we want to bring your program to our college. Uh, we're bringing in 100 uh, males of color and we only have 10 come back the second year. I told the president of that institution, I said, I don't know anything about your institution. It's my first time here, but I can tell you right away, you have a lot of disconnects in your systems. Let's find out where your system disconnects are and we'll get these students connected and we'll help them navigate this experience we call college. I wish you could see their data now that we found the disconnects, the things that we needed to do to bridge those students to the right resources and to the right excitement, to the right, to the right sense of feeling valued and a sense of belongingness. We found those broken systems. Let's keep this moving. Reimagine in the student experience. We need to do that as educators. Even students have a role in this as well, encouraging a culture of collaboration, where we have partnerships among administrators, faculty, staff, students, and others of the community ecosystem, other stakeholders. Collaboration increases impact when everybody is joining together in it. Now, I tell you, we have the traditional models where many professionals came up with plans to impact students' lives. We need to include those students in those discussions and shaping those plans. In my program, 
All of our chapters and all of our schools are required to have a strategic plan from middle school through college. Imagine middle school students sitting around the table with their principal to shape a strategic plan for their buildings. And middle school students are saying, you want me to come to school? You want me to behave appropriately? Let me sit in a room to shape a plan that's gonna impact my 12 year old life and perspective. That's a powerful transaction. We don't need to weed students out. We need to help them thrive. All students deserve the opportunity to learn. What does that look like? Looks like this graph, this, this graphic here, many of you all have probably seen the left side equality. We, we, we say we, we give everybody the same. Well, do we really give everybody the same so there's the same opportunity? Uh, that's what they say. The right side speaks to equity. So we see that everybody now has the same opportunity to see the game and to be a part of the game and to envision the game. But on the left side, everybody may have a block, but not enough blocks to see the game. You get it. For Saab, in my program, to achieve inclusive excellence, we are convinced that our institutional partners must have. As I talk to institutions around this country, we have over 350 and 41 states. They must value and engage and celebrate the rich diversity that faculty, staff, students, and parents bring to higher education. Create a climate where students, faculty, and staff feel valued, respected, included, and certainly safe. Create a climate that ensures all members of the community embrace the quality of being fair and just, as comfortable maintaining their own individual and cultural identity as they are having candid conversation with others about their own, respecting differences. That's what we ensure as we move forward. We're challenging institutions to be morally and physically responsible and on board. There has to be a paradigm shift amongst our institutions if we're gonna really seriously bridge gaps, academically and otherwise. We have to bridge those gaps. The force of inequality, here's some data shared at a social mobility conference that I spoke at. The retiring us generation is better educated than the replacement generation. This is the first time in our, in, uh, for any developed nation to face this, and the US faced that today where the retiring us generation is better educated than the replacement generation. We, our generation today, are not exceeding their parents, as I said before, educationally or economically. Education is the most important counterweight on the social justice scale. So when we talk about social justice, education is at the top of that list. Even Nelson Mandela said that. Education. Business leaders who think college graduates are prepared for the workforce. 11% as shared by NASPR, Student Association, uh, National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. 11% of the business leaders think college graduates are prepared for the workforce. Whereas our chief academic officer who would believe that their institutions are very or somewhat affected, 96% said that our students are ready. 11% of the business leaders said they're not ready. So that's a gap right there that we need to certainly bridge. Primary reasons male of color, some of the research that I've collected over the years, don't persist or graduate. First of all, academic, and secondly, uh, financial, and certainly the engagement piece, lack of engagement. Academic, financial, lack of engagement. Main reasons male of color do not persist. And what we know about our students of color and low-income students, as we've done research, and certainly the educational trust is shared in this, they're more likely to live in underdeveloped areas within major cities or in sparsely populated rural areas, which we do a lot of work in. They're more likely to have, a, have, have attended ineffective elementary and secondary schools. I was one of those students. And they are less likely to have um, access to college prep and co coursework, less likely to have access to college prep coursework. So when we think about bridging the gaps, particularly for underrepresented students and low-income students, some of the policies and practices we have to think about, the use of alternative measures of student success uh, and, and not place so much emphasis on standardized tests. I personally didn't do well at standardized tests. Providing students familiarity and access to post-secondary courses while in high school, the early college high school model is a good example of what's going on right now to give students from, uh, some access and awareness of what they expect and even have some 
experience taking college courses while in high school, engaging students during their summer, providing additional support and not just relying on information alone, but certainly fostering uh, ways to bridge the disconnect and overall engaging leadership, administrative leaders and the, from top down to SWAT strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threat to SWAT their policies. Institutions need to SWAT policies that might create institutional barriers. That's what that institution in Minnesota found out. There were some policies, there were some systems in place that needed to be revisited, rescoped, revised as not to create institutional barriers for students, particularly students of color. Bridging the academic achievement, achievement gap. Three C's that I have come up with that are key. First of all, connect. The three C's of effective engagement, you have to connect. Number one, communicate. Number two, certainly you have to communicate with students. I walk around on many campuses and I ask students all the time, do you know your president? Do you know your chancellor? Do you know your vice president? And they, well, I think I've seen them. I said, no, do you know them? There's no connection. There's no communication. And then once you connect and communicate to be consistent with them, particularly with males, you have to be consistent with males. Consistency is key on a regular engaging basis, consistency. Certainly, as we think about, we've, we are firm believers that building relationships with our participants equals success. So when we think about bridging academic achievement gaps, relationships are key to that success. Do you have a relationship faculty with students in your classroom? Do you engage the young people who tend to sit in the back and don't engage? Do you find ways to get them involved? I'm an engager. I, I wish I was there in person now so I could touch you, so I could walk around the room and see your eyes and feel your presence. I'm an engager because that equals success when you develop relationships. Students will tell you, young men in particular, I'll do your work if you would just love me. If you just love me, I'll do the work. I just want somebody to care. I come from a household where I don't get much encouragement, inspiration, some of our students will tell us if you ask them. I just want somebody to care. I'll do the work. I can do the work if someone would just simply care. None of us are where we are without the person who loved us. Everybody has a merchant of hope you can think of right now on this platform, one person in particular who has made a difference in your life to make things happen for you and for you to be where you are now. You can think of that one person right now. You should write them down and call them right after this platform, after this uh, engagement ends and thank them once again for being there for you. We have to keep learning institutions, Gateway and others uh, represented today. Keep learning. Anyone who stopped learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. Henry Ford said that back in the day. We have to keep learning about ourselves. Keep learning about our students. Keep assessing, keep engaging, keep asking our students. I hate going to campuses where professionals tell me our students are apathetic. They don't want to do anything. They don't come to programs. No, you may not be giving them the programs they want. Have you asked them? Have you engaged them? How much do you involve them around? The table. I'm not talking about the same students, but really getting out and engaging your students, the ones who don't come to meetings, the ones who don't come in your student centers and student unions. How do you get to those students to ask them what they really want, why they're so disconnected? Imagination is a muscle that has to be developed and, and exercised every day. Just like we do anything, our imagination has to be exercised daily. I challenge my sons and others of my mentees and young men in our program every day imagination. Think about Walt Disney. Walt Disney, who was rejected, and he was told he didn't have any imagination, was fired by one of his first jobs. They told him, you have no imagination. Go figure. Look up Walt Disney and see what he did, if you haven't been to Disney World. The secret to my success, the secret of success is to be ready when your opportunity comes. I tell my young men, stay ready. Stay ready. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Stay ready. No matter how diligent or persistent you have been, there is not one of us on this platform who made this journey towards success by ourselves. I don't care what you represent today, faculty, administrator, chancellor, president, nobody has made this journey alone by yourself. Surround yourself with good mentors. And I tell students, stop whining and complaining and get this done. Oprah Winfrey made that quote and certainly I agree. I, said, I stated that quote, I'm sorry. Every great successful person 
shares the capacity to remain authentically centered, centered, focused, and powerful in the midst of emotional storms. Maintain your perspective. Students today, one of my concerns about students today, particularly as I work with our young men, lack of resiliency, no stick to itness. I tell them to expect rejection. I just said Michael Jordan, Mike Bloomberg, Walt Disney, I just said, was rejected. Madonna, Oprah, all were rejected. I don't have time to get into that. But find your anchor, maintain a perspective. Another way to help bridge the gaps, the perspectives. This young man just passed away recently. I love this quote, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. We lost him recently uh, to uh, colon cancer. The only real difference between people in the 1% income bracket and those who are not is mindset. We have to remind our students of that every day, every day. And I got the $40,000 car loan example. Uh, students get out their first job or first degree certificate. And the first thing they want to do is go buy an expensive car. And I tell you, most uh, loan, uh, loan uh, companies, banks want that car paid off in five to six years. But we'll borrow money and we'll take 30 years to pay $40,000, $50,000 of student loans back. We'll take 30 years, but we'll pay a car off in four or five years. Perspective, mindset, all about mindset. I'll keep this moving for the sake of time. True success is being able to spend your life how you want to and helping others in the process. Quality of life is peace, in my opinion. And I can go on and on about that. The next 48 hours, particularly for the students who are joining us today, will be significant. Hopefully, you get my email. It's very simple, tbledsoe at sobnational.org, tbledsoe at sobnational.org. And I hope you follow up and share something with me today that you took away two or three takeaways today. But I wanna say maximize your moments. 90% of students that I talk with and give my card to as I go around the country, don't follow up with me. They come up and ask for my cards all the time. Dr. Blesso, can I get your card? 90% don't follow up. That's a research project right there. You cannot do life alone for my students in particular. Get help, acknowledge your challenge and get past your pride. Ask for help. Get past your past. Develop a sense of order. Structure is important. The number one reason most students don't complete is not financial. It's lack of it's, it's the lack of time management. Out of order. Out of order. And financial will be number two, in my opinion. Successful people have certainly value order and not chaos. Whatever you touch, Dr. Bledsoe, will be made gold. I had someone tell me that one day, years ago, almost 30 years ago. Someone told me, whatever you touch will be made go, Dr. Bledsoe. And I didn't receive that. I thought that was kind of far-fetched. And I didn't see myself uh, uh, doing what that person said. And these are just some pictures of students I've touched around the country and places I've traveled. Here's one young man said, you have a heart of a servant. Thank you for having a heart like Jesus, he said. You are truly appreciated. I wanna be just like you, Doc. Most students call me Doc. Those who know me affectionately know me as Doc. This young man today uh, was a president of our um, a chapter at the University of Texas, Austin, and he is uh, now a successful motivational speaker, speaking all around the world and doing some incredible things. Jonathan Sprinkles is his name, and he engaged me in 19 and changed his life, and he's never been the same. This young man here, and you all may listen to E.T., Eric Thomas. Can I just hang out with you, Doc? He asked me over 17 years ago. Eric Thomas is a worldwide speaker now, and I've had him speak on many days at our conferences and events. Some of y'all may know ET and listen to him and wake up to him in the morning. I talk to students all the time. They know him all around the country. Can I just hang out with you, Doc? This young man here, Brian Heap, get him on your campus if you haven't. He's one of my faculty members for my program. I'm with you, Doc, he told me over 10 years ago. I'm with you, Doc. Will you be my mentor? Will you be my mentor? And now he's all around the country engaging students in, in K-12 districts and colleges and universities. Get him on your campus. He's awesome. Set him up in the virtual engagement. You'll love him. Brian Heat. As I begin to close, our society needs to reestablish a culture of caring. Nelson Mandela said. So as we think about bridging the gap, the, the academic, academic achievement gap, do we have a culture of care? A society that that has established itself as a, one that cares. We've heard many days, it takes a village to raise a child. 
What kind of village exists at, Gate at Gateway Community College? What kind of a village exists on whatever campus you represent today? In whatever space you represent today? How are you part of that village? Is that village unified? Does it provide service in an authentic, caring way? That's my challenge. Give yourself permission to be a change maker. I always wonder why somebody didn't do something about that. Then I realize that I am somebody. I'm that very person I talk about who's not doing anything. Are you that person? Are you that somebody that's making a difference? Give yourself permission to be a change maker. Some of the celebrities that have supported my work and still support us, Lamont Rucker is an actor. Many of you all may have seen him on a number of Tyler Perry movies and other things you see Lamont doing. He's a, good, he's a good friend of mine. Another good friend, Halle Berry. Some of you all know her. I mean, well, you know Halle. Pretty sure everybody knows Halle. <laughs> but uh, Halle uh, certainly has supported our work and inspired our students. And as a good friend to our program, we're certainly appreciative for having come spend an entire weekend with us at one of our conferences. And I think some of uh, the Maricopa students may have been uh, in Detroit with us when we had Halle Berry. Ma Carvin Wine and five times Grammy Award winners are current uh, ambassador for our program. And Carvin will be joining us in Dallas, Texas in March as we celebrate 30 years for my program. Everyone on the platform is invited. Go to our website, sobnational.org, sobnational.org, and certainly you can uh, register and come and celebrate with us on March 20th in Dallas, Texas at Brookhaven Country Club. We're going to be there. The love you don't give is the pain that you carry. The love you don't give is the pain that you carry. I share this with my young men. They carry a lot of pain every day. Many of them have issues with their fathers and others of family members. But the love you don't give is the pain you carry. I came up with this quote over 12 years ago, speaking in Houston, Texas. And I'm reminded of something Chadwick Bos Bos Bosman told his brother, who's a pastor, his brother's a preacher, and his brother was praying for him as he was struggling in pain. And up to the day before he passed away, he asked his brother not to pray, to change his prayer up. He said, just take me out the game. He said, I'm exhausted. He just take me out the game. He was basically asking his brother to quit praying that I get better because I'm in pain. I can't take any more. Take me out the game. Dr. King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing? for others. What are you doing for others? That's a personal question for you on this platform today. That's a collective question that staff and divisions, departments should go back, faculty should go back and have co conversation with your colleagues. What are we really doing for others? What kind of experience are we creating for our students? What are we really doing? Brings me to this last couple of slides. This young man came to my conference four years ago, almost five. I'd never seen him before. And this particular picture displays me giving him a hug because he told me that he wanted to take himself off the game. He had tried two weeks before he came to my conference to take himself off the game. In other words, commit suicide. I got him in a room and I talked with him. I found out why he wanted to do it. And I won't get into all that today. Don't have time. And I finally told them, I said, we're going to help you. And in my spirit, I normally would recommend him to refer him to professional help, and therapists and so forth on his campus, going back to his respective campus. In this case, I didn't do that, my people. I kept him with me. And he's only seen me. He's only been with me for the last four and a half years. I've changed his life. And our mantra for my program is saving lives. And the second part will come up, up, and come up on the next slide. This young man, I've helped him get his life together. I've encouraged his spirit, and we got him to, got him to an entirely different level. That's him there. He's gotten his associate degree on the left, his bachelor's degree on the right in psychology, and I helped him with all of it. And I've worked with him. He has never seen the therapist. He's only seen me, and I've, I've been in his life since the day he gave me a hug on this picture. And today, he is my son. I adopted him four years, three years ago. He is Ronnie Lee Bledsoe. 
I talk with him every day, every morning and every night. We touch every day, at least twice. And he's working on his master's in higher ed with a desire to become a college president. Isn't that amazing when you just touch? And we're writing a book. I said, son, what do you want to name the book? What do you want to title this book? He said, a father's touch. And that's what we're going to title the book. So stay tuned for a father's touch with Ronnie and I telling our story. And I close with this today, my good people. The Dalai Lama, when asked what surprised him most about humanity, answered, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. Then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die. And then he dies having never really lived. Frame that for your perspective. Put that on your refrigerator. Thank you so much for your time today. This is my contact information. I'm so honored to have been with you today. I wish I could have been with you in person to share with you more close in person, but maybe that will happen at some point in the future. Thank you so much, everyone who's been on this platform today. Thank you so much, Dr. Bledsoe. Really appreciate it, sharing all your wonderful information. Um, I think it'd be great to leave that slide on for anybody who wants any of your contact information just for a few more. Okay, um, put it back up. Um, just so they can have it. I know I had somebody ask about your email earlier. I put it in the in the question and answer, but this way it would be great to have um, them there and you're getting a lot of Thanks, Doc. So they're adopting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, I encourage everybody at this point to please continue um, putting some questions in the question and answer. I have a few that I'm going to start moderating here in a minute. So go ahead. If you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer. Make sure you're sending them to all of us in case um, I miss one. Uh, the first one we got is from Jeffrey. Uh, and he's asking, do you think that the cult of instant gratification can be blamed? Can you repeat that again, Colin? Sure. <clears throat> do you think that the cult of instant gratification, and he put instant gratification in quotes, can be blamed? And I wish I could engage and get a little bit more context on that question, but I'll, I'll at least respond to what I think I'm hearing. Uh, I think that uh, instant gratification is a byproduct of something much deeper. And I'm I, again, not having the full context, I'll just take a stab at it. But instant gratification, if he's talking about a generation that might be one uh, 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 blamed or accused of instant gratification, or ones who value that, uh, that's a byproduct of something much larger. Uh, as I talked to earlier about uh, one of the concerns, I was talking to some students from New York uh, Stony Brook University, just a few weeks ago, they had me on the platform, a virtual uh, engagement. And one student asked me, Dr. Bledsoe, uh, when you think about when you grew up, uh, the time that you grew up uh, versus our time today, what's the fundamental difference or differences you see? I said, one thing that I really uh, I'm most concerned about uh, when I engage young people, particularly males, I want to own that, males, because I engage males more often than not, um, is a lack of resiliency. I grew up at a time where my generation, I'm at the end of the baby boomers, we were taught to be resilient. And so when I think about the, the, the uh, immediate gratification, our values were different. Uh, the, there was no immediate gratification spirit I possess. I, I, I merely wanted to finish whatever I started, which was one, oh, that was one standard. My dad was very big. My dad, seventh grade education, dad then finished high school. Uh, my mom finished high school. Most of my relatives were not formally educated, grandparents and others who couldn't read or write. That's what I come from. So there was no instant gratification in the sense of that being a standard for us. We were taught to work hard. To work hard enough. And I always wanted to give back and go back and help someone in the community, help someone in the family. And I've been fortunate uh, for that person who asked the question about instant gratification. I challenge my sons around that. I challenge my nieces and nephew, all that I've, all, the, all, all of them I've helped personally, many of them through school, et cetera. 
But I think instant gratification is a byproduct. And what I mean by byproduct, there's something, un, uh, a common denominator that drives the spirit of, the mentality of, a mindset of instant gratification. There's something drives that. And that's typically the lack of something else. That may be in the household, that may be uh, the circle that one hangs in, that may be uh, the parents that don't engage, or some of my young men don't have fathers, don't have strong males in their families or circles. Uh, and uh, they depend and rely on others like myself and some of the uh, maybe individuals on this platform today. But I think lack of gratification is a byproduct of something bigger. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go down the questions in order. I know some people might have put something in about as a follow up to what you just said. So maybe we have to circle back to that. But Anna sure. is asking, what are some ways we can reach and engage the students who don't engage and participate? <laughs> Um, one way, uh, just generally speaking, for those students who don't engage and participate, you have to find a way to engage them. Where do they hang out? They have to go to class. If they're going to be on campus, they, they don't have to go to class, but we would think in many cases we can catch them or engage them in the classroom or in the academic building. But learning the traffic, you know, I, my question on many campuses, when we start my program in particular, where do students hang out? For those who are not involved in organization, what do they do when they are on campus? Just killing time between classes. Where do they hang out? Are they in the student center? Are they in a particular restaurant or uh, cafeteria? Where do they hang out? We have to meet students where they are. Many of them won't come. I just said earlier that Generation uh, Z, they're not going to ask her for help. They're not going to seek you out. Prettiest buildings and the most qualified faculty and staff and everybody from Harvard and Yale and if you don't engage and connect with students, and particularly males, they're not going to engage your services. And I tell campuses that everywhere I go, it's about engagement. You have to touch them. And I'm using touch more subjectively. How do you touch them? And one has to know their campus, their traffic, their field, their, their demographics, their ethos, if you will. And if I was on your campus, and that's what I do, I study campuses, particularly those campuses interested in my work, or my program, we do an audit of that campus. Let's see where how your students are performing now. Where are they hanging out? Where are your track? Where are they, where, where, what's the what's the traffic like on your campus? And so connecting with students who are not involved, which is very the very reason I started my program was to give students who aren't the popular students an opportunity to be involved. The ones who aren't interested in maybe being an athlete, or maybe they're not an athlete. What happens to those students? So my program, I started this organization 30 years ago, asking questions, what if, what about the student who isn't this? What about the student who's not connected? How do we get them connected? How do we get them connected? So I think one has to, again, know their campus, talk to the students, and get to those students. One of the things as practitioners we do, we continue to wear out the same students for everything. And some of those students might be on this call and say, oh yeah, I get called to be on every committee. And we have to change that, that particular approach. Find those students who aren't as involved. In many cases, they'll be honored that you reached out to them because maybe they were intimidated to, uh, to reach out to you, especially a lot of our young men. The Gates Millennium Scholars Program, and I'll say this quickly and I'll shut up and then entertain any other questions. I'm good on time, so I'm not rushing. Um, Gates Millennium Scholars Program, Bill Gates Scholarship Program for high school students, reached out to me and said, we cannot get males of color to apply for an incredible scholarship program. I said, well, the young ladies are going to apply. They will do things differently. Young men, you got to go to them. You have to connect to them. You got to get with them in a different way. You have to understand their mindset and, 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 and their sense of, there's a book that came out back in the uh, Early 2000, Dr. Basilou, if you're still with us, uh, called The Cool Pose, The Cool Pose. And The Cool Pose was written about young men talking about how they pose and how they posture and why they won't engage and, and what tends to get them excited. So read The Cool Pose if you're interested in, in some uh, ways of understanding about young men. But certainly we have to find the avenues and the places our students hang out into, uh, in order to connect with them. Again, connect. The three C's, I go back, connect, communicate, consistency. Not just once a year, not just every now and then, consistency with our students is very important. How do you connect with them consistently? 
Thank you so much. True connection is really, really very important. Um, there is a follow up question that I think fits in here right away. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that one. So Terry is asking any ideas for engaging during virtual learning when students aren't actually on campus and that's right now our reality right now. So any idea and just advice you can give us and how can we get them to engage and participate um, virtually since they're not on campus? Well, uh, and, and that's certainly a challenge. Uh, we're going through that right now with our constituency because uh, many of our groups are uh, virtual and that's a different space for them. And we're running into the all kinds of issues because some people uh, don't have the infrastructure at home to engage virtually. So you got all kinds of dynamics playing out. Um, but oftentimes, if we're going to uh, engage them virtually, and I'm not sure the, 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 the full context of the question that was raised, but one way to engage people virtually, you might start with, with small opportunities to engage them. Uh, and it depends on the context of engagement. Uh, if it's an academic engagement, engagement where it's a classroom setting uh, and the professor is uh, facil facilitating the class, that's different than an organization, club, trying to engage or student government engaging its constituency. Uh, so I think that um, uh, one might want to do a survey uh, uh, if there's an opportunity to survey. We did that for our constituents. Uh, or uh, late summer, we surveyed them to figure out what were some of the challenges virtually for them, uh, were they having issues getting connected, did they have the devices at home to be connected, uh, uh, were there issues uh, with the way they wanted to be connected, how they want to connect, uh, the platform we want to use, uh, would want to use. We asked our students all of those questions. So I think certainly asking questions and uh, getting as much information to inform uh, how one uh, desires to be uh, connected virtually uh, is certainly a good way. You can't go wrong with more and more assessment and surveys to really get, get a feel for what people are thinking, and hopefully they will share uh, uh, their thoughts so, so that it informs how you shape uh, whatever experience you shape. Thank you. Tamara had a nice question. She's like, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I would have read more. <laughs> I, I was not a disciplined reader. I'm so I'm so honest about this. I would have read more. Uh, I was not a disciplined reader because I did not come out of a family that um, uh, that modeled that. Uh, again, most of my family couldn't read or write, so I, I don't think you can expect that people will be uh, sitting around reading books when I walk in the house. Uh, my dad uh, was a hardworking man and. Uh, you know, a seventh grade education. So uh, read to me was, a, um, when I say read, a discipline reader. So when I started my doctoral work uh, 27 years ago, one of my struggles was I was not a discipline reader and there was so much reading. For those who are on this platform, particularly students who desire uh, uh, moving up the ladder, graduate experiences, getting your master's, possibly your doctorates, uh, I really encourage and I really encourage our young men who oftentimes are, uh, uh, are guilty in many cases, victims of this, they don't read a lot. And uh, so graduate school becomes a real challenge for them or when the opportunities or uh, assignments are given where they're, it's very reading intensive. But that's one thing I, I always say, I would, I would have been a better, a, a more disciplined reader where I just sat down to read for pleasure. And that's something that we actually do now, encourage our young men to read at least one book a month. And that's a big deal for young men who don't read at all, to read 12 books a year, uh, that's a pretty good sized library uh, coming from no books. <laughs> so, but reading for me would be what I would, uh, and I'm not even saying that to be comical, uh, it would be, I would have read more. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Steve had a question. Um, he wanted was asking if you could elaborate on what was meant by the phrase soft-minded men. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Dr. King meant, uh, and certainly what I uh, embrace it to me, uh, young men who are not challenged to think. Uh, and we deal with that today. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I work with a lot of uh, current gang members and those who have been in gangs. Uh, and and their, 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 their uh, stories are different in terms of why they're in the gang. Uh, 
And oftentimes, young men are in the gang. And I tell teachers and educators this every day. Young men don't join gangs to steal, kill, and destroy. They, get, they join gangs to get love. They join gang to have family. Uh, maybe the gang was their first opportunity to be a leader. They didn't go to Gateway Community College, so they weren't in student government. So I, I think Dr. King certainly meant, and I would I, I embrace it to me, young men who are not taught to think. So you remember that quote right before that particular quote, whoever asked that question? Uh, one thing that pains more, uh, more, most people more than anything is simply having to think, Dr. King said. Some people don't want to think. So it's easier to go and try to make 3000 on the corner selling drugs than to think about the consequences of that action and to think that maybe I will spend the time it takes me to get a certificate degree from Gateway Community College and do the quote unquote right thing if I just think. But a country that continues to produce soft minded men and Dr. King is saying those men who don't think soft minded men. Easy way, half-baked solutions, easy answers, microwave mentality. That's what he's talking about. Thank you. Again, to anybody who's asking the questions, if you need more clarification, feel free to put them in the Q&A so I can do the follow-up for you. Um, Christian had a question. Um, it's a little longer, so I'm going to might try to read it a little long, uh, uh, slower. So he um, says, you talk about how young men need guidance and seemingly some form of mentorship. As a young Hispanic male coming up in a broke Coming up in a broken home, I resonate deeply with your points on support structures. Where should young men like me begin with finding the support? And that might vary. Um, whoever asked that question, uh, I want you, I want to invite you to email me. My slides should still be up. I gave you two different emails, but both of them come to my phone. Sobnational at AOL.com. And this is to anyone who maybe didn't ask a question, but want to ask a question, maybe offline, feel free to email me, sobnational at AOL.com, or the one I gave you early, T. Bledsoe, which is my uh, first initial last name, T. Bledsoe at sobnational.org. Either of those emails will work. But for that young man who asked that question, I work with the young man that I just gave you the example, Ronnie. He is uh, Hispanic, black, his mother is black, his, his father is Hispanic. And, uh, and he really more, he gravitated more to the Hispanic culture growing up. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, and then I work with a number of Hispanic males all around the country. Our second largest group in my organization of thousands would be Latino, Latinx, uh, Mexican brothers that we work with every day. But to find that it's gonna vary because I don't know your context. I don't know what your reality is personally so I'm careful about giving general re responses when I don't know the specific of who I'm talking to. So whoever asked that question, please, I do invite you, please, and anyone else who wants to email me, you will not overwhelm me with email, please know. I do this every day and I do it for a living. And I'm real, as Dr. Vassalou said earlier, I'm real about my talk, I walk it every day. So please email me and I'll help you with uh, framing, um, the, the type of plan structure. And one thing I will say to that young man, and maybe for the benefit of others listening, uh, a, a part of that structure is having a plan. Most students don't have a plan when they come to college. Most don't. Uh, most end up in college because they just think it's a good thing to do. Uh, uh, if I go, uh, 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 there's likely something good's gonna happen, but there's nothing like having a plan for college. And in my program, we have what's called the personal development plan, PDP. All of our students, young men, are required to have a personal development plan on file. And at any given point, for the young man that asked that question, if you're working with me, you're going to have at least a three to five year plan at all times. What am I doing three to three to five years out, at least three years out? What does it look like? So I just started at Gateway. Three years from now, what will I be doing? What's the plan? Who do I need in that plan? Who, the, who do I need in my circle? Who do I need mentoring me? What kind of experiences do I need? You know, do, do I need to be getting some shattering experience depending on what your career interests and aspirations are? So I'll help you with a plan, but anyone interested in a plan, and I, I assure you, you'll get a response within 48 hours. 
Thank you so much. Um, I also know that we have the men's program um, that uh, we have, and I think right now it's Israel class who's leading it. So I think it was Christian who had asked that question. Christian, if you want any information on that, please put it either in the chat or the Q&A, and we can try to put you in touch with the person who does our men's program here for Gateway. Um, and I can put, um, if I remember, I'll put also his um, email address in the Q&A, so you can also contact Israel class who is leading the men's program right now for us. And Carla, Carla can I say something about the men's program? Sure, please. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, and for the, all the campuses that may be represented today, that have men's program. I'm familiar with many of the campuses program there in Phoenix and uh, the Maricopa system. Uh, given again, I've been there some years ago to uh, talk to the young man. I know many of those young men are gone. Uh, some of them still stay in touch with me. However, I want to encourage institutions that have men's program. And I talked to a lot of institutions around the country, uh, whether they have our program or not, uh, men uh, uh, initiatives, male initiatives, if you will, from any campus, anywhere around the country are always open to any of our conferences, any of our events. And if Ray uh, Ostos is on here from the district office, Ray knows that he has brought many students to our conferences over the years. Uh, our conference is always open. But here's the thing I want to say for campuses with males program, make sure that uh, men, young men love to get together and, and you won't have problems with getting young men together, but make sure they have the guidance uh, that uh, that group, your group respectively at Gateway, where whatever campus represented, has a plan. You heard me say all of our chapters of men initiative on campuses around this country, they're required to have a strategic plan. All of them are required to have plans because their plan drives their programming and everything they do on their campuses or in their schools, if it's middle schools or high school. A plan, guidance, order, structure. The get together, fun, hanging out, the socialization piece, that's key, that's important to the experience. But to really, really get the benefits of the benefit of uh, investing in program men initiative, make sure they have plans. And if you need some help with that, that's something. I know Jesse and I uh, had some brief conversations about maybe ways that uh, I, I might be able to help or our program could help. You don't have to have our program. You don't have to be a former member of our network for us to share some of our best practices. So I did want to just mention that quickly. Thank you. We really appreciate all that you're doing for our district. And I know you've been to our district quite a few times and um, made quite a great impact on us. So hopefully that um, collaboration will continue. Um, there was um, one more, but it was more of a comment, which I think was really important. Um, Jeffrey was just following up on um, I think something you had said about engaging with our students and meeting them where they're at and seeing where they're at. And I just want to read what he wrote because I think it um, kind of resonates with all of us. He was giving us a quote from Napoleon Bonaparte. A man does not have himself killed for a half pence a day or for a petty distinction. You must speak to the soul in order to electrify him. So he's just following up by saying you have to speak to students soul in order to electrify them, which I think is totally exactly what you were talking to us about and what we all need to take more to heart and um, do that. We do Absolutely. have one more, one more question from Jean. She wants to know how engaged are the students you work with in voting? Uh, they are very engaged, um, uh, leading and sponsoring and coordinating voter registration drives. Uh, they're very uh, a civic engagement and certainly being involved um, in exercising their option and right and privilege to vote. Uh, we do encourage and certainly make them aware of those rights and responsibilities. But our guys, um, as a part of the program and the model that we have, they're very involved. Uh, and I can tell you, they're very much on deck with what's going on around right now in our country with this upcoming election. Uh, they're very involved. Um, and as activists uh, on their campus, I was very proud of them. Many of our chapters uh, during the time we saw all of the protests in the streets around the country, our guys were out there. Uh, they were the ones that were doing it more peacefully. Uh, we do have chapters in Minnesota. Uh, actually, we just started a chapter at a community college right in the county where George Floyd was killed. Uh, we just kicked them off. They were our first, and they'll go down in our history, has been our first virtual uh, 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 startup 
chapter. We've never started a chapter fully virtually into this one college, North Hennepin Community College. I know they're gonna, their provost is gonna love that I'm giving them a plug right now, but uh, we're so glad to have them on board. But certainly our guys are very much involved uh, and we do encourage them to be uh, a, a pretty, a very much on deck with what's going on as contributing citizens in this country. Thank you so much. Yes, voting is very important. Everybody go out and vote. Um, I'm just going to put another plug in. Well, yeah, uh, Steve has another question. Um, do you find that educational environments are assuming roles of love and support that are lacking in the home? Is that a role that should fall to educational institutions? Uh, unfortunately, it has to. And, and let me just say that um, this is not the first time we've seen that happen. Uh, for those in higher education uh, who've been with us for a while, uh, I've been uh, over th three decades now, going on 35 years. Uh, there was something in the in the past called in locus parentis, in locus parentis. So look that up and, and learn about that phenomena in locus parentis. And so basically, in locus in locus parentis spoke to uh, a home away from home, you know, hand holding, giving students the nurturing they need, guiding them through the experience. Uh, so back in the 50s and probably the 60s, in locus parentis was rampant and, and certainly something that was valued. And then we moved away from in locus parentis as we started getting into the late 70s, 80s, where we wanted students to be more autonomous and independent and, you know, be drivers of their own experience in life. And we still want that for students. But what we're finding, as I said earlier, some of the concerns I have about generations following uh, the students aren't as resilient and as uh, uh, independent and the desire to be as independent. There's been a lot of, uh, and I think my generation, and I always tell my generation, I think we're the ones, the baby, the end of the baby boomers who kind of drop the ball because we start, uh, I think we, we spoil the generation. We literally spoil uh, a generation. So now we have, uh, I'll go back and say quickly as I, uh, uh, and I love talking, can y'all tell? <laughs> but uh, at 17, 18, my mom told me, go get your stuff. I'm not filling out any of your financial aid papers. You do everything you need to do and just sign my name. That's what my mother told me. And I went to Mississippi State. I was scared, I was nervous. I made a lot of mistakes, but I got it done. But, I, but she said, you can get this done. You're, you're capable of doing this. We have confidence in you. You've already shown us your entire life that you're a leader. So I left with that level of confidence. That's not what we have today. So today I'm doing more handholding and more guide and more having to speak to the soul and inspire and get people fired up and get them clear about their vision than I've ever had to do in my almost 35 years. So I don't know who asked that question, but yes, I think institutions, unfortunately, but in a way, fortunately, there is a, a place that students can go. Because if you can't get it at home, thank God you can get it somewhere. And to have a campus that embraces you, that gives you the love, the inspiration you don't get at home, many of us will not be where we are now had it not been for some educator or some institution or some organization at a college that made a difference in our life, or some faculty member who touched you in a class um, uh, in an in a inspirational way that made a difference in your life. So I think, unfortunately, and by default, education institution, look at K-12. I mean, uh, kids coming to school where there are dysfunctional families and, uh, and mom is there with five, six kids working three jobs, don't know their fathers. Uh, some know their fathers and fathers are not really active in their lives. And they go to school and they 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 uh, attach to the teachers and they attach to others. So I, I think I need to wrap up. I'm, ram I'm rambling on too much, but I think, yeah, unfortunately, and in a good way, fortunately, institutions are there to provide that nurturing, that handholding that many of uh, many students would not have made it had, had they not gotten that, that, uh, that love. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Steve, you is asking, what can a woman do to motivate men to be more engaged and open? We have a number of women. Uh, uh, what's her name again, Tamara? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Tamara uh, and others listening. We have a number of women who support our programs around the country. And I'm gonna say uh, for the women on the call at, at every level, faculty, staff, student, administrator, uh, 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 community leader, supporters, whoever you are today, 
we are, uh, and I work with a lot of women as well. Uh, I have a lot of female uh, mentees of mine, uh, many of them that I've worked with for years, and some of them are college presidents, uh, et cetera, and doing incredible jobs. But women can be understanding uh, what men need. And I think the women who support the groups on respective campuses around the country for our program, there are women who really want to see guys be successful and understand uh, that uh, they can be supported and not get in the way of what uh, the, the time guys need with guys. And there are times that guys obviously need help from everybody. But uh, and I think there uh, we have a good examples of young young ladies and even some female advisors in some of our male programs. At the end of the day, the research said it doesn't matter if you're male or female or what your background is. It's just we just want somebody to care. Here's one that I leave you. My grandmother, Rachel, who couldn't read or write. She often would say jokingly, I don't care uh, uh, what your color is or where you're coming from. If the house is on fire, just bring some water. And my grandmother said, I don't care if you're black, white, brown or yellow. <laughs> if the house is on fire, just bring some water. So women. Uh, understanding what or at least seek to understand what men need and how you can be supported. We certainly embrace that. I'm, I'm uh, responsible for helping a female group get started because I recognize and as much as I do work with young men, uh, there's also a need for young women, particularly middle school, high school, a lot of needs for young women coming out of those uh, experiences and spaces as they move on through life as well. But just understanding what men need and find a way to be supported without getting in the way of what they would deem uh, time they would want just with other men and just understanding that. Thank you. We have more of a general question, which I think I could probably even answer. Um, Brian is asking, will we have a copy of the presentation? So we don't have a copy of the presentation, but we are recording this um, and it will be sent out to everybody. Um, so look out for an email coming hopefully soon whenever we have the recording rendered and ready to go. Um, but Ruben is also having a question and asks, saying, both you and Dr. King talk about connecting with people's spirituality. How do you address that aspect with students in higher ed? Um, I address it, if you're asking me personally, um, I address it in a, in a very um, respectful way. And what I mean by that is, um, I just um, advised a young lady this morning from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, who just started a nonprofit organization, and I've been helping her get, the, get it off the ground to help the community. And, and interestingly, uh, her thing is bridging the community. That's her thing. Interestingly, when I think today, right, bridging the community. And the one thing, uh, I, I, she's just putting a board together, and I helped her with all of that stuff. And I said, you know, uh, she said, well, we're praying at the beginning of our meeting. So, I said, well, be careful about prayer. I, I'm certainly a person of prayer. I said, but always respect uh, the differences in how people might manifest what they believe. Even in our program, my organization, uh, it's not faith-based. I think I'm careful about religion. I'm not a very religious person. I'm very spiritual, but not very religious. I'm careful about religion because I think oftentimes religion separates and we get into differences and mine has to be better than yours. And so, but I think spirituality is key and important. Uh, when I started the, uh, this, when I went full time with this work 15 years ago, I left my last vice president position and decided not to do a college presidency. I, uh, the one thing I wanted to incorporate in the work that I would do is spirituality. And I knew that, and I told the president at the college that partnered with me, I no longer wanted to be on the payroll. He said, why? Uh, he just passed away about a month and a half ago. I said, because I don't, I know what I'm going to do and I'll, and then may not agree with the institution's policies and I'm going to get into spirituality. Uh, if we're going to help these young men, if we're going to help people, we have to help them spiritually develop. And I know that may not be embraced by everybody. So I don't want any barriers and I'd rather not be on the payroll. And he said, how will you make a living? I said, I'll figure it out. But I, I know this is the way I have to do it. And I'm so grateful to say 15, almost 16 years later, uh, it is work. We're doing some great work. The young man that I told you about who wanted to take his life, I worked with him on his faith. That's a spiritual process. And I did things with him he wouldn't have gotten from a therapist, although I am a therapist by training. 
but I did things with him. He wouldn't have gotten from a therapist because we went the spiritual development route and it has definitely made an incredible difference in his life in ways I wish you could meet him. If you come to my event in Dallas, you can meet him personally. <laughs> Hopefully one day we'll be able to travel again, right? Like, email. yeah, I yeah. say we can travel theoretically, but I'm just saying more easily. Than absolutely, than absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, right now, I don't see any other questions. If anybody, I mean, we have somebody asking about the access to the recorded webinar. Um, again, we will be sending that out. Um, it will be sent to everyone, um, even the ones who didn't participate today. So the recording should um, hopefully be, um, be coming um, our way soon. It takes a couple a day sometimes just to render and make it all available. So please hang in there and um, wait for an email coming around. If not, you can always contact us if you haven't heard anything from us in a few days or in a week or so. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please go ahead and um, put them in the question and answer. We have a few more minutes. We have time till uh, 11, theoretically. I know Dr. Vasilu would like to also do a little um, closing. Um, I'm also going to show the survey again one more time. I am going to just say thank you again, Dr. Valetso, for everything. Or should I say, Doc? Thank you, Doc, for your wonderful talk and everything. I want to close a little bit with Steve was responding to when you talked about if. Um, the role of love is part of what we need to be doing in higher ed. And he was just responding to your um, comment by saying this was really good. It generated so many questions, compassion, civic responsibility, and love for one another, et cetera. One of the best. So thank you. And with that, thank we you. thank you for everything. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Vasilu, who is going to do some closing. Um, and then I will share my last slide again with the survey. We really hope that everybody who participated enjoyed it as much as you know, I did, um, and I learned a lot and hope that we can continue this work all together um, moving forward. Um, but yes, we would love some feedback so that we can bring more people like this to our campus, bring more of these conversations to our campus. So please take the survey. I will share that here in a minute. Um, Dr. Vasilou. Well, thank you so much, Carla. Dr. Bledsoe never disappoints. And as a small token of appreciation, I had to change my background and uh, take you <laughs> back in time. Uh, last month in Miami with the beautiful beaches south and South Beach. So, Dr. Bledsoe, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I hope that everyone enjoyed the, the presentation and, uh, and the message that Dr. Bledsoe delivered. And um, and something that we were all reminded of is uh, our reaffirmation and commitment to become a student ready college. Uh, a lot of times we expect students to behave certain ways, but we're here to serve the students and our local constituencies and communities. Uh, so we have to be ready for them and meet them where they are. Um, a lot of the examples Dr. Bledsoe used uh, resonate with me as I have similar up. Uh, bringings, my mother, which was the force behind me going to school and staying in school, uh, chasing me out of the soccer fields um, and ensure that I went to school. She had the third grade uh, education. We worked on the agriculture fields uh, day in, day out, including myself. Um, and uh, we persisted and our resilience or my resilience uh, uh, been influenced by my mother's and my father's support got me where I am today. Um, we have several examples and I will use this, uh, the last example. Uh, Randy Lopez, our financial aid uh, counselor, whom I connected with the son of one of the contractors that was doing some work at my house and he's interested in joining Gateway uh, for our um, Toyota Automotive program. And he was struggling with his financial aid. Uh, Randy reached out to him. Thank you, Randy. I believe today you're meeting with uh, Mauricio. Uh, Mauricio's dad's statement to me was, uh, please help him um, navigate the financial aid process, the FAFSA process, because he needs to get to school. If he doesn't get to school, he'll be out on the streets. Um, so that passion of a father uh, that not wanting his son to be out on the streets, but rather get an education and do something with his life. Uh, connected with me deeply and we're all humans at the end of the day. We all have gone through similar experiences. And how do we connect with students by just sharing the stories that we all have and building that trust that the student can open up to us um, 
and uh, been able to provide the support that, that they need. Um, again, I would like to thank uh, Jesse and our student life uh, leaders uh, for uh, assisting us with uh, this presentation. Uh, Dr. Bledsoe, would love to see you again and to see you in person. Uh, and we don't have uh, business in uh, Arizona, but uh, we'll, we'll be creative next time. And <laughs> okay. Lakes, so maybe we, we have an outdoor event. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, you have a great rest of your day. Dr. Bledsoe, thank you again. Carla, thanks for um, um, moderating the conversation. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. And please go and take the survey. Here's the link and the QR code. We really appreciate you. I'm sure we'll send it out again as well. But if you can, go ahead and take the um, survey now. And thank you, everybody.